Welcome to the Bike Life Podcast by Warm Showers Foundation, where we will be sharing knowledge, experience, tools, and stories of touring cyclists and hosts from around the world. I'm Tavra Lee, the woman behind the scenes at Warm Showers Foundation, the leading platform for cyclists looking for hosts and to connect with a passionate international community. Find out more by visiting us at warmshowers.org. Now, on to the show. Hello, and welcome to Bike Life. This is Jerry Kopak, and if you don't recognize my voice yet, I'm the new host, taking over the reins from Toverly. But don't worry, she's still here as our executive director, but she's focusing her time on making your experiences as hosts and travelers even better. A little bit about me. I've been the finance guy for Warm Showers for about five years now, and when I'm not building spreadsheets, you'll find me hosting other bike travelers at my home in Breckenridge, Colorado, or maybe somewhere else on my own little bike journey somewhere in the world. Go with what you've got. This is the advice from Chris Clinch, who at the age of 56 and without a ton of experience or fancy bikes, set off with his wife from their home in England on a big bike tour through Europe. Hey, Chris, welcome to Bike Life. Hi, Jerry. Thanks for having me on. Great to talk to you. So I got to ask, there's probably a lot of people who are out in the world, maybe listening to this show, who are maybe pondering or even fantasizing or dreaming about a big bike tour, but might feel a bit intimidated because, well, maybe they don't have an expensive bike or all the right gear. I think I understand this, but tell me what you mean by go with what you've got. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, it, it's and you're absolutely right. Um, you know, there's so much um, information out there. Um, on social media or just generally, you know, you can Google a location or whatever else and immediately you've got some some person on a fancy bike with fancy kit and then, and they've got all this know-how and you've got to have this and you've got to have that. And really where I'm coming from is, is the kind of opposite of that really in as much as there never is a kind of a good time to do anything like this because you know we've got the work life balance you know we've got family we've got we've got businesses or, or jobs or there's health or you know you just don't know where to start um and you know my my kind of thrust really i suppose is that um there's never a perfect time um and you never have all the right kit and you know you never can plan enough um so um you know you've really just just start with what you've got and certainly for me um in terms of the equipment um we had the that we had i went with my partner helen and we had two bikes one um they were both recycled in as much as one was pulled out of a, a skip which is like a dumpster um <laughs> for nothing and i fixed it up and the other one um came really cheaply like less than a hundred pounds again and, and i just kind of fixed it up with really just old bits um from my from my bike shed that, that i've had for for many years um really old stuff um and the kit we took with us it was just really our a tent we had from you know the occasional camping that we did and and we didn't really have much specialist kit we just used what we got and and, and recycled what we had and um and in terms of like the planning or you know that kind of thing it it's it's kind of hard to plan something um for us um it was a it was a journey through south america and you know we had some key points and some key places we wanted to go to and the line seemed to naturally go from the north um to the south um but the really in terms of the planning um it really was just let's find a cheap way to get to south america which was bogota and then colombia right? really it was yeah yeah colombia in the north um but even you know kind of weeks before we set off um with with our bikes and our kit we decided um to go to start in the colombian caribbean in in cartagena which is you know, um, in this case, a, a day's bus ride away. So things were still unfolding as, as you know, as we, as we were literally going. And that continued to be the case as we, as we cycled our way 
our way south, really. Um, and in terms of timing, we, Helen and I both had our own small businesses. Um, Helen has a, is a physiotherapist and I had a, a small property maintenance business and, and we had loads of work and, <laughs> uh, and there was never really a break and people were keen for us to do work. And, um, and in a way, we, we could really not see a gap in our calendars. Um, and we just had to make a decision really if we wanted to do this to just go because we we couldn't find a way to make a break um but we both knew we had we were really enjoying our work and we got good feedback but um we just needed to try and find a way to do this a little bit more differently we were finding we were giving perhaps more to our jobs than we were getting back so we just had to try and work in a different way and we tried but we couldn't really find that way so we thought well maybe we just need to make a clean break and yeah. try and find some time and space um, <clears throat> and so hey it, uh you know a, a, a longer holiday in the very compass would be great um, yeah in terms of like never in the terms of like family life um uh that wasn't easy either i've uh, an 85 year old mum who's great but she was she's aging um and um we we also had had some challenges um, in our fa- in our family lives, and as much as Helen had just lost her mum to cancer and was struggling with coming to terms of that, I have two teenage daughters um, that sadly um, I have lost contact with, um, mm. and that's quite difficult to um, to uh, you know to kind of deal with emotionally. And so there was sure. like a lot going on, and. We were like a little bit overwhelmed, I think, and about what was going on at home. And yeah. um, as crazy as it may seem, it just seemed like um, a bike trip or or a, a trip away would maybe try and give us some headspace to do okay. that. So, um, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how it all started, really. Yeah. So that definitely paints a good picture of go with what you've got. The fact that you pulled a bike out of a dumpster and yeah. and made it work and put it together and yeah. and we'll we'll get to later in our talk about did you have any issues with it but <laughs> I, I like what you said about being able to to make a break from work there's never mm. really a good time no. and someone said this this quote to me years ago that stuck with me and it goes like this nobody on their deathbed ever said i wish i would have worked more Absolutely. And that has been a really powerful message in my life. And, and, yeah. and I'm not saying that everyone can just step away from their job and mm-hmm. go take a bike to South America. But I really like the fact that you guys were able to just figure it out, go with what you've got, carve out mm-hmm. some time and just make this happen. Now, mm-hmm. in addition to maybe not having all the right gear, you had something else to consider. You had uh, some health issues. You live with type one diabetes. Now, yeah. last week I talked to another guy who also is living with type one diabetes, an accomplished mountaineer, climber, all these things. He was in his sixties, I think. How has this diagnosis changed your life? Or how about when were you diagnosed? Yeah, well, it, it's still something that's evolving um, sure. in as much as um, I was diagnosed with type one uh, just before my 50th birthday. So, um, yeah, I've had it like, um, you know, seven years now. So it's still evolving um, and I'm still learning to live with it. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that was a big question mark. Um, And uh, certainly it was an added added dimension to to consider in terms of equipment. And um, the... Diabetes in itself is you you have to administer um, you're insulin dependent, so you you have to administer uh, insulin. Um, your body can't make it, and so uh, you have to I have to inject insulin every time um, I consume any carbohydrates, so any kind of food really. Sure. So obviously on a bike, um, I'm using a lot of energy, so I need to consume a fair amount of um, of, of fuel to keep me going. So. Um, and I, I didn't know what I would be able to get 
in South America or indeed where I'd be able to get it from. Of course, South America has a population of diabetics like any other continent, but I wasn't quite sure of what um, insulin I'd be able to get, what equipment I'd be able to get, because there's a, a variety of um, equipment and insulin types available. So I ended up um, mm. collecting together and paying for a year. So I got a year's supply of insulin, um, which comes in in the form I use it is little. They're like pens, like sort of large um, pens that you write with. And so I took a year's supply of that and then obviously a year's supply of monitoring because I have to monitor my blood glucose. So I had to take a lot of monitoring kit. In addition to that, I'm also asthmatic, which means <laughs> I have to take an inhaler. So anyway, to cut a long story short, I had about <laughs> 10 kilograms of equipment um, and it was probably, That's a lot. I don't know, maybe 30 litres worth of space. And as you know, Jerry, from, you know, you're a bike traveller yourself, um, the things you try to reduce uh, when, you, when you're travelling by bike is, is weight <laughs> and yeah. also try and, you know, keep <clears throat> stuff to a minimum. So that was like a bit of a head scratcher. The other thing about insulin is you've got to keep it below five degrees centigrade. And certainly there was many times when we were, um, you know, in excess of, I mean, you know, we started in the Caribbean. It was, um, you know, up to 40 degrees plus centigrade. So keeping that cool um, was was a challenge. <clears throat> but um, it, I just, you know, what I do want to say is that I um, was able to do that um, and that um, – there were times um, when I struggled to get the right diet um, uh, because diabetics really need um, a relatively unrefined, low sugar um, diet. And in a lot of places, um, it was uh, the, the local taste is very sugar centric, certainly Colombia. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and another, and yet another <clears throat> facet to this is that Helen and I are both vegetarians, and Colombia is a very meat centric, very sugar centric, a fantastic part of the world, and I would recommend it to anybody. But um, the diet was quite a challenge. But hey, you know, I did it. Um, <laughs> the insulin, um, contrary to all the advice I got from um, the medical experts and also the guys who manufacture this stuff, it survived for 12 months from, um, you know, temperatures down to zero and uh, temperatures ab above 40 degrees. I was managed to keep it cool um, in little gel packs, which work really simply. Um, and it was fine, but, um, yeah, the, the diet, um, finding a diet um, that could fuel me in a way that didn't spike the glucose and that wasn't also meat-based was a challenge. I would say probably finding a vegetarian option in many of the more um, remote um, areas of South America was probably as much of a challenge, really. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I would – anybody <laughs> who is, um, you know, diabetic or asthmatic or vegetarian or whatever else, you know, you can manage these things. Um, and – the great thing is that, um, as many diabetics will know, um, if you exercise, then um, the body finds a way to deal with and uh, take in the, um, the fuel you need, and therefore the amount of insulin you need to inject um, is, redu is reduced significantly. So actually, for diabetics, um, cycling is a great way to travel because you know, you need, you can reduce your insulin dependency significantly. And I would oh. say towards the end of my uh, 10 months in South America cycling, that my insulin dependency had reduced significantly. So it is, it's, it's for those diabetics out there listening, it's a great way to travel. And um, I did find I was able to get insulin should I needed it. Um, it shouldn't be a barrier, um, really, for for people wanting to do this kind of thing. Um, so, and we travelled to some very remote areas and travelled some. You know, we went up to five thousand meters Ooh. in the Andes, and um, it was cold. And we spent a lot of time um, in very hot places. You know, like uh, you know, like the Colombian Caribbean and on the Pacific, we dropped down to. So, it's fine. You can do it. There's always a way. You know, it's, it's possible. I love that. So the takeaway is, is that 
this can be managed. You can live with type one diabetes. It doesn't have to require you to stay home. Like you were able to get a year's supply of insulin and keep it cool through the hot places like Colombia and Ecuador. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it was, um, I was really, um, uh, doubtful at the start, whether that this, um, whether this would work. Um, and so I was kind of resigned to be needing to buy stuff. So really from the start, I was searching out places to get insulin and understanding yeah. where I could get it from. But, um, the, my blood sugar was relatively stable, um, using the insulin I had, and I'm sure it went, the temperature significantly exceeded, um, you know, the five degrees C. So sure. yeah, it was great. It should, it shouldn't <laughs> be an, it shouldn't be an issue um, either getting hold of it or traveling with it. Um, and I'm going to, uh, there's a, a product I used called Frio and it's simply, it's really simple. It's just silica gel that you soak yeah. in water and the evaporation process just keeps a bit like when we sweat as humans, um, the sweating process keeps us cool. The, um, the, the, uh, when it evaporates the same thing with this, with this product, Sim- it's super simple. You just soak these gel filled little sacks again and off you go. And they're great. Um, and I've used those um, successfully. So yeah, great. I think this is great information for anyone who might be listening, who might be yeah. considering a trip uh, of this nature that there are options out there, no matter Absolutely. what the climate is. Absolutely. Um, so I have another question here. Was this uh, was this your first bike trip? Because it sounds like you pull bikes out of the dumpster. <laughs> so maybe you're not yeah. real. Are you not avid cyclists? No, we. I think we have we have cycled before. We enjoy cycling. We we love we love the um, we love the outdoors. Um, I'm talking to you from from the Lake District, which is in the northwest corner of um, yeah. England. It's a national park. It's a small national park, and we love it here. Helen's originally from North Wales, which is a very similar. Um, type of environment um and the national park also so no we like the outdoor we like the outdoors we walk um we do a bit of running and we we have done some cycle trips but really nothing um nothing significant nothing for more than a week or so we've we've cycled um the scottish islands uh, uh literally a couple of hours drive from here so it it's very easy for us to go up there and then we cycle using the ferry system and so we have cycled a bit but no, this was far and away uh, the most significant cycle tour we've ever done. Um, and so, yeah, it, everything was new. Um, everything was new from, um, like, what do we take? Because um, we, 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 we didn't really know what the climate was going to throw at us. Um, my geography is not brilliant, but we, we set <laughs> off um, from... Cartagena, which is in the uh, Colombian Caribbean in the north. So we're setting off in a, in a Caribbean climate, very hot, uh, very humid um, on the coast. And then we, you climb through the foothills of the Andes, um, heading really for, um, for Medellin, which is arguably the second largest city probably in, in Colombia. Um, and, you know, they're at a, a, you know, probably a couple of thousand feet. So it's cooler, it, it's damper. Um, and we, we followed the Andes, um, the Andes was really, um, really off to our, um, our right for the majority of the trip. So we knew we were going to be going up high. And so we took with us, um, a range of equipment from, um, you know, like something to swim in to, you know, to down equipment and stuff to, to keep us, um, safe in the mountains at four or 5,000 meters. So we took a heck of a lot of stuff and, um, we were probably over yeah and the, and 10 kilos of gel packs um but we soon learned what we needed and didn't need and um and you know as you'll know you, you actually need very little and i think uh. we ended up giving away about um w- well one pack we had a rack pack which is a pack that sits on top of your panniers at the back which yeah. is about 30 liters we ended up getting rid of that amount of stuff each and then giving each? it away to each, yeah, 30 Ooh. liter pack each. Um, we gave that and just left stuff um, and gave it to other cyclists who needed it. Yeah. And we ended up um, living very, and I think one of the things um, I've come back with is a realization I don't really need much, you know. Um, I, you know, I don't really need much in terms of equipment. So, um, 
yeah, it's nice to have all this kind of fancy stuff, um, but really you don't need much. And we, you know, we, we cooked, um, we had, a, you know, we had stoves, we had cooking equipment, we had a tent, sleeping bags, and, you know, but we maybe had like two shirts and a couple of pairs of shorts and, and a down jacket. And, you know, it was, um, life on a, on a bike is, is, it's kind of very liberating because, um, you know, you don't need much stuff. You just need something to eat and drink and, and, um, you know, you just need to think about somewhere to sleep at night, um, which always presents itself. It does. Um, but we were able to like, it's, it's very, um, uh, just a very simple life with not much, much stuff. Um, and like you realize actually not only does stuff cost money to buy, but you've kind of got to maintain it, whether it's a car or whatever. And it's nice living simply. I think I'm going to say it's almost primeval because you're just looking for food drink and some shelter you know and um, yeah. it's very liberating and you know as a result we were able to to kind of think about and and process some of the the issues that we were unable to at home um you know um because of our busy lifestyles and commitments and stuff like that so it was um yeah it, it, it's great um it's it's a really you know you got a lot of time to think on a bike <laughs> it's great I uh, I couldn't agree more. It's definitely a very simplified way of living. And so yeah, I'm curious, absolutely. were you always a minimalist or did this bike tour make <laughs> you minimalist or did it make you more of a minimalist? No, I wish Helen, um, well, Helen will listen to this, but I wish she was here now looking <laughs> over because no, she, uh, I am, um, I, I was and still out to a little bit. I have so much clutter. Um, I have, we call it clutter. I have so much stuff um, like I think anybody else um has but i will say that the stuff is going and that i certainly um can see the value in in i in not needing as as much stuff um yeah. so i would say yeah i think helen probably still laugh when i say this but i think i'm moving towards minimalism um <laughs> i mean certainly if you've got something that you've that you've not touched for 12 months, it's sitting in your loft or the garage, then do you really need it? Or um, just having multiples of things, right? Like yeah. you've got maybe two down jackets or two rain jackets. Like, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, you, you offloaded yeah. 30 liters of gear. Yeah. Each. It's crazy, isn't it? Each, each. Um, no, it's crazy. You, you, you realize you don't need much, but Hey, I think what I have come back with is a realization that, um, Certainly in Europe, we're under a huge amount of pressure to to consume, and and you know um, it's there in and kind of in the background on social media, and sure. you know certainly in the press, it's you know it is sell, 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 and and um, you know there's a lot of very clever people out there working for businesses, you know trying to get you to buy stuff. So yeah, do, I'm not. I certainly feel lighter um, when I get get rid of stuff, but. Um, yeah, I think I can under I I understand the minimalism movement, and there's a couple of guys in in the US, isn't there, who are going around talking about minimalism, and they've done a couple of books. Um, yeah, I've seen those. Yeah, and I certainly it's the way I think it's it's the way to go. Um, I certainly think there's a lot of overconsumption um, in the West going on. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> that's a whole nother story in itself, <laughs> oh, right man. there, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So. You guys live in Europe. There's all kinds of Euro Velo routes going yeah. through Europe. Why did you yes. choose South America? Whose idea was this? Yeah, good. It's a very good question. Um, it certainly logistically wasn't the easiest option. Mm -mm. Um, and you're absolutely right. And Euro Velo is, um, is very high on the list of what comes next. Um, but I think um, certainly... We, the, there's a there's a couple of things about y Europe that is an issue for certainly people living in the UK. So we're not part of the UK is not part of Europe certainly from um, uh, a passport and visa perspective. So we can only stay in Europe for three months and then we have to come out again. Okay. So South America, there are you know a number of countries in South America, all which are fairly easily accessible for three months. Um, at a time uh, with a UK passport, 
The difference is that I can say travel um, through Colombia for three months across the border into Bolivia or Venezuela or, or um, you know, in Ecuador, and then go straight back into Colombia again. I can't do that in Europe. I have to come out for three months and stay out for three months and then go back. So there's some visa, there's some visa challenges. Um, it's certainly very easy to travel through South America. It's it's certainly very cost effective for a European. Um, the price of living in the north uh, is very, very uh, good. Um, in Chile and southern um, uh, Argentina, it's more expensive, more like Europe, but certainly um, in the north, northern reaches, it's it's very good. I think culturally, Helen and I were lucky to have travelled to um, Peru before and and did a, just uh, two weeks, um, inevitably did Machu Picchu um, out of Lima, and we were struck um, with the culture and certainly South America culturally and historically is somewhere that's always interested us. So, um, and I enjoy following cycling um, and competitive cycling and the tours, the, the European Grand Tours, sure. Tour de France and the Giro and the Vuelta. And um, Colombia has an incredible cycling history. Yes. Um, it's, it's, I'm going to say it's relatively recent um maybe you know from the 50s 1950s onwards but they've produced a number of tour de france winners recently and the culture there is incredible um for anybody who's like cycling um colombia is as an incredible cycling recent history and um, and success and so i certainly wanted to try and see some of that um and so yeah, it was just a combination, but also, as I say, our although we had a rough idea of we didn't have a route as such, although we knew we were going um, from the north to the south, we just had a number of places in South America that we liked to that we liked would have liked to have seen, and so it really started off this idea of going to South America for a longer period. It started off um, during the COVID pandemic i think with the frustration that everybody felt about being restricted sure and and then just a kind of a, a list being drawn up of like oh well i'd love to go uh you know to here i'd love to go to Cartagena, and i'd love to go to bogota and uh, medellin and then oh well we'd like to go to quito i'd like to see the ecuadorian amazon um and then yeah we definitely want to go to bolivia and the, the salt flats around the Uyuni and um, Solaire, yeah. know, Mendoza and yeah and you end up you know you end up all the, with all these points in South America um and we we ended up going as far as um as the south of as well as far as you can go really um in um in Argentina um and but that was never really the plan we were just sort of joining up a load of dots really um and so the the bike, the cycling aspect, only because we thought, oh, we'll just go and, and fly or bus or or do something, use a variety of transports. But the cycling thing only came in towards the end, really. And we just thought, well, hey, if we're going to go <laughs> there, we you know we're going to be spending a lot of time and money, and um, you know using transport, which is not particularly environmentally friendly, and you know you don't really we wanted to see and experience culture and you don't i don't think i've ever been able to do that just hopping from plane to plane or station to station so we in my experience cycling relatively slowly through country is the best way really to see the culture and to and we wanted to talk to people and and understand and maybe try and learn from them about ways of doing things differently because um, we certainly couldn't get the work-life balance or there was something not quite working for us in the UK. So um, we just wanted to see how it all worked in South America and, and we're blown away and, um, by <laughs> the hospitality, which is legendary, certainly in places like Colombia, um, where people were literally begging us and pulling us off our bikes to come and stay with them. It was incredible. Um, and that really continued all the way through South America. Um, um, but uh, Colombia, particularly incredible, um, incredibly hospitable people, people who 
sometimes have nothing, but um, should they just want you to stay with them and will give you anything and just make it happen. It, it was incredible. Nine times out of ten, if we asked, we arrived up in a village somewhere at the end of the day saying, hey, where can we camp? They'd often say, well, right here, you know, and <laughs> right here could be literally their yeah. back garden or, or a shop, you know, where we were buying some supplies for the night. We often stayed in, in the back of um, gardens of shops or um, one family, one Colombian family. Um, we stayed with like three different branches of the family as we traveled south. It was incredible. Um, uh, yeah, in, incredible hospitality, incredible people. And um, certainly having come back now to the UK, we, um, we want to pay that back, that hospitality we received. And so we want to do a warm showers. In fact, we're registered with warm showers as a, as a host. Good. Uh, Good. So we want to, we want to pay that back. No, it's important. Um, we really want to pay that back because without that, um, we would have been, um, in some difficult situations at times. So it's, it's nice to be able, we call it paying it forward rather than paying it back, paying it forward. Um, and so, yeah, we'll be looking forward to doing that. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned that without some of this hospitality, you may have been in kind of a pinch at some point. So yeah. I like to ask this question. Um, so here you go. With any trip of this length, things inevitably can and likely do go wrong, especially yeah, so. if you have bicycles that you pulled out of a dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> Was there ever a moment that you looked over to Helen and you said, oh man, how are we going to get out of this one? Was there ever kind of yeah. like, just like, oh no moment? Yeah, um, there were. I mean, we we there were, but we managed to adopt um, a kind of I'm going to call it a South American attitude that like whatever, because you know we we in the main we travelled through some very remote. We spent the majority of our of our ten months out there above three thousand meters in in the Andes, and so we were it, a lot of the time we were in very remote situations and a lot of the villages and the towns we travel through are very isolated and they're kind of self-sufficient and they kind of make it happen regardless of what the issue is they kind of they, they work it out and so initially when things did start to go wrong um with bikes or routes or weather um or or transport um we did panic and but i think as time went on we we kind of um, we adopted a, a more relaxed attitude of just, hey, just waiting and just let's let's try and think about this. Let's just take some time because we work in a very time-pressured environment, I think, in Europe and, um, and where we kind of, something happens and we expect an immediate response. But I think we took a, we've taken a more um, kind of laid back a, a, a approach to stuff now. But yeah, certainly um, we, um, we had in northern um, Argentina, we'd been in the desert for like three weeks and we were faced with another three week stretch of desert. Um, it was incredibly hot and um, climate change is affecting everywhere. Um, and, you know, the arid places are even more arid and dry. And um, it's a combination of temperatures and, um, you know, sand um, and just the discomfort of it. And so we decided to take a bus. Um, so, but our the bikes we had to take apart and kind of bundle together as best we could and put under the bus in the bus and then but the bikes and us got separated the bikes arrived and there were parts missing and they were bent parts and <laughs> broken so this these bikes had gone on a long journey somewhere else um and so yeah and we were kind of struck stuck in the middle um of nowhere really at, at an, in a bus station so um and it was, we literally had parts missing. Um, but with the help of, of, of local people, we, we were able to find some parts, um, you know, and we were able to like, you know, put the bikes back together to get some distance down the road and then to get to a bike shop. Um, so that was one time where we literally, we literally couldn't go anywhere because uh, the bikes um, were kind of, were, were broken. Um, yeah, the um, cyclists and dogs um, like uh, don't really work <laughs> in as much as they um, uh, 
wherever we we went um and i think this is this is common that uh, it's a common cyclist thing that um uh, dogs just their nature they just want to chase uh, people on bikes and this was the case um in a lot of parts of south america um but we we adopted a technique which um helped us deal with dogs nine times out of ten if you just stop they eventually go away um and but in um we um we were in the southern part um of uh argentina and yeah sadly i i was just cycling out of a town um it was a sunday and this little scrap he looks really like it wasn't i'd like i want to say it was this like it was this ferocious dog and like you know, <laughs> he chased me and we battled but it literally came out of nowhere and, and bit my left calf and went ah. down to the bone and there was a lot of blood and it was a bit of a mess um and we just so we did a bit of a first aid aid on it, um, but it was it was quite a mess, and I needed stitches. Um, but and it but it's so it's Sunday, small town, um, El Chalten. Um, so it, you know it's in Patagonia. Um, it's a beautiful beautiful region, bit of a climbing mecca, um, but not a lot in the way of services. Um, it was it was a quiet Sunday. Sunday is um, even in the tourist area is quite religiously observed still, and so there's not a lot open. Um, so I was lying on the side of the road bleeding, um, and this guy literally just pulled alongside in a car. He just said, "Get in," um, and Helen stayed with the bikes. Um, and we anyway, and he just took me to a health center in the nearest town back in El Chalten that was shut. But he managed to get um, somebody to open it up, and then they managed to get a, a, a nurse and a doctor to come. This is Sunday, hmm. um, and they yeah they stitched me up and sorted me out, um, and then you know took me to a cafe where I could recover a bit. And then took me back to the took us back to the bikes, which were fine. They were just there on the side of the road. You know, it wouldn't. This would not happen in Europe. Wow. And um, and and then yeah, and we and then we got um everything back, and then we had to take a couple of days out whilst um my stitches kind of just um kind of uh you know sorted themselves out, and then we were back on the road again. But and you know, and that is so typical of of South America, um, that you know it's Sunday, um, everything's shut. You know, but these, you know, this guy just scooped us up. You know, we couldn't give him anything. The medical services, I, you know, they didn't want any money. We couldn't help. You know, literally nothing. Um, uh, it was amazing, and and so that's again a um, a situation where um, the locals just helped us out. You know, without even asking. You know, it's just yeah. you know, it's absolutely amazing, um, <laughs> and it really does. Uh, it really is incredible the hospitality in South America, and this this was the case all the way through. Um, and so we we definitely want to be more open and more supportive. Um, uh, you know, I think going going forward with with travellers. Um, so we hope to start hosting soon. <laughs> oh wow! I love hearing that, and I and I've had similar stories about hospitality and kindness for no other motivation than other yeah. than just, just to be kind, good humans. Yeah. So I, I love yeah. hearing that. So yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a takeaway. Go to South America, yeah. right? Get on your bike, travel. Yeah. And if yeah. you can spend the time, go, go see what the rest of the world is doing. Absolutely. And Hey, you know, we, we ended up, um, take, you know, kind of earmark in a year, but we were 10 months, but, um, you don't have to go for like a long time. You know, we, um, in uh, in Chile and Argentina, there's something called the Carretera Austral, which is a famous mm -hmm. a cycling road. Sure. It's a road, a rough road, and we met and we met loads of people who were just there for two weeks. They'd flown in country and were just cycling for a couple of weeks. And um, um, it you know you don't have to go, and you don't even have to go like far. I mean, you can literally go from your front door and just go and and see what happens because. You know, as I think everybody on who who goes on a bike will tell you, a bike is a great way to make people. You're a low threat. Everybody wants to help you. Most of the people we met in South America thought we were so poor we couldn't afford motorcycles. So <laughs> hey, we've got to help these guys out. You know, they could only afford bikes. You know, and they've got to still stay in a tent. Yeah, um, so it was yeah. incredible. Yeah, everybody we met. No, it was fantastic. And there's a great community out there of cyclists. 
There is. Um, you know, and hosts. And hosts. You guys, yeah, are, you know, play such a key role. Um, it really is an incredible community. So, yeah, get out there, guys. Yeah. If you're, uh, if you can travel, travel. If you can host, please host. Let's try to yeah. connect everyone and make this world a yeah. little bit smaller. So, Absolutely. go with what you got. I love that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time today to talk to me. Uh, for all the people out there who are listening to my conversation with Chris Clinch, I hope you enjoy the show. If you did, give us a like, a share on your social channels, or just tell your friends. These stories hopefully will inspire you to set off on your own journey and maybe make the world feel a little bit smaller, one pedal stroke at a time. My name is Jerry Kopak, and until next time, keep riding. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed the show as much as we enjoyed making it. Wherever you are listening, please leave us a rating and a review as it helps us reach more cyclists and hosts around the world. Visit us at warmshowers.org to become a part of our community or on Instagram at warmshowers underscore org. If you would like to be a guest on the show or submit a question, please make sure to email us at podcast at warmshowers.org.